You are listening to the Gospel According to Song of Solomon, a fruitful marriage devotional commentary, written by Kevin Foster, narrated by Karen O'Brien. Unless otherwise indicated, Scripture has been taken from the King James Version. One hundred fifteen, a closed garden. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Song of Solomon, chapter four, verse twelve. The King. Our sister's garden is the produce of pleasures and enjoyment that awakens her king. It is an area with distinct borders to showcase her favorite foliage. Shade trees and appealing fruit. A well kept garden satisfies the eyes and brings joy to the soul. A vibrant garden must have an ample source of water or it will surely die. Our sister is described as a garden enclosed. This is descriptive of the church, comprised of individual souls who love God and Christ. Within the garden are peaceful pleasures and tranquility. This speaks to the value of our sister, her chastity, and her willingness to guard it. Chastity is a gift. Chastity has an older sister named Virginity. See Devotion 7, The Virgins. The fruitfulness of this blessing cannot be measured. Holding these gifts close does wonders for building a relationship and increases the longevity of a marriage. If a marriage fails, the neighborhood is harmed, the city is wounded, the nation is burdened, and the world suffers. Think about the pressures placed on the chaste who live in a culture that spends an inordinate amount of money to destroy them. There is a direct assault on marriages, potential families, children, and God. The unchaste breed depression, anxiety, loneliness, undesired pregnancies, abortions, and disease. A part of the unchaste is consumed and departs with another, never to return again. Do not ruin yourself. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 22. Refuse the inordinate affections of today's civilization. Don't be defeated. Christ is Lord over the garden. Malachi chapter 3, verse 11, New King James Version says, And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Christ is able to revitalize the dead, dried-up springs and repair broken fountains. If anyone be in Christ, or he or she is a new creature, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 a garden enclosed is that private area kept by a wife, available only to her husband. Husband, drink waters out of thine own cistern, and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad, and rivers of waters in the streets. Let them be only thine own, and not strangers with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed, and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Proverbs chapter 5, verses 5 through 18, New King James Version. Only the king has access to the garden enclosed. It has both a spring and a fountain. A spring tells us a greater source is not seen by the natural eye. The fountain implies an abundant life through the Spirit of Christ. All of this suggests an endless, fruitful life with seeds that produce after their own kind. Sweet incense. Dear saint, value what you have sealed up inside. Do not give the world an opportunity to misuse the gifts preserved only for the pleasures of your king. 116. A Garden. I woke to the scent of frolicking fruits rippling past my nose and thought to myself, the vines must have dealt a yield in the place where they dwelt. March through May are resurrection days. Spring equinox brings in season. Cutting short the night to hasten the light, laying hold on newness of life.
Early to rise under lavender skies, my breath favors a kettle. Strolled by the great oak and snuggled my cloak, passing nettles, beetle, and petals. I entered the garden covered with dew before the sun had consumed it away. And there I remained the greater part of the day as birds sang and squirrels played. I passed the rows where sprouts grew bold, breaking free from graves and sepals, reaching high where they lie, happy to be alive, for the time there will they abide. Glistening diamonds sprinkle silent pools, dragonflies dance o'er those reflective jewels, doves croon their sentimental tunes, while the shadows toll, it's now noon. The fruits are holy, their juices sweet, the sights and sounds of the hour a treat. Occupied ants shuffle past my feet, a sure sign there's plenty of food to eat. I saw the vines where busy bees had aligned to be the first in the garden to dine. And as I ate, there are decisions to make, to brine or to wine. Collective stares while a breeze toyed my hair, I declared, there's plenty to share. A garden full of fruits, with nuts to boot, and onions, carrots, and other sweet roots. These are the pleasures found in glory treasures, spending time in the garden with God. Awake and meet him there, in love together, share of the fruits he has prepared. Sweet Incense Come into the peaceful garden with the king. Leave out all the world's weak and beggarly elements that seek to distract. Be still, commune with him, and delight in the fruits he has in their season. 117. Orchard of Pleasant Fruits Thy plants are an orchard of pomegranates, with pleasant fruits, camphire with spikenard, spikenard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrhs and aloes, with all the chief spices. Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verses 13 through 14. The King Our combined plants are like a great orchard of pomegranates, surrounded by exceptionally exquisite fruits. The crimson-staining, fruitful promise of the pomegranate, see Devotion 96, your temples, veil, and pomegranate, speaks of a fruitful life, the sweet blood of Jesus Christ, and its ability to mark the soul of everyone tasting its redeeming power. Camphire means to ransom, cover, and to satisfy. See Devotion 40, Camphire, Vineyards, and En Gedi. This shrub has the power to die, staining all who ceremonially use it. It portrays the blood of Jesus that stains and completely washes away sins. If any man or woman unceremonious uses the gospel of Christ in some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. John chapter 10, verse 1. The odiferous ointment of spikenard reflects the sweet expression of the soul. See Devotion 37, My Spikenard. We see in this ointment our ability to praise and adore Christ for who he is. Saffron, known as the crocus saffron, is one of the world's most expensive spices. In antiquity, this spice was used to flavor drinks and sweeten meals. Its regal purple flowers are as a collar, encompassing three blood-red stigmas. This is a picture of the beauty and royalty surrounding the Trinity and their priceless crimson covenant. A scented reed, calamus, is born submerged in muddy waters, and yet it breaks through and reaches toward heaven. This depicts the saints whose flesh was born of the clay in the earth. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 says, And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The sweet scent of the Trinity breathed life into us, and we broke away from the sin that held us buried. We have a new resurrected life within the King as we journey toward our heavenly home. Mingling cinnamon with other precious spices comprise the holy oil used to anoint the priests and the instruments within the tabernacle. Exodus chapter 30 verse 23. We are priests of God 
and the presence of the Spirit anoints those who love Him, pouring over the tools and talents we use to preach and teach the gospel. Frankincense and myrrh speak of the sweet holiness and bitter sufferings of Christ. See Devotion 38, A Bundle of Myrrh, Devotion 83, Perfume, and Devotion 103, Mountain of Myrrh, Hill of Frankincense. As Christ was in this world, so shall we live a life of bittersweet victories as a testimony to God and Christ. And last are the aloes. These succulent plants are found throughout the Eastern world, possessing a distinct flavor. The aloes retain water and survive in the most arid conditions on earth. And for the lover of Christ, you have the fountain of living water in your soul, bubbling up to revitalize in a spiritually dry environment. This assorted array of spices were found within our sister's garden. Each plant and tree within the souls of men and women who love the king have an image of the life of Christ living in them. Pomegranate, his fruitful crimson staining of the soul. Camphire, his blood that ransomed and covers a multitude of sins. Spikenard, the sweet expression of praise regarding his holy life. Saffron, his priceless blood. Calamus, his and our death and resurrection. Cinnamon, the essence of him and the anointing oil in the temple. Frankincense and myrrh, his and our bittersweet life. Aloes, him, the vessel with the spirit without measure, of which we partake. All the chief spices, the totality of Jesus Christ, who enriches the souls of the saints. Sweet incense, look at your life in Christ as a fruitful garden watered by the Spirit of God. Watch your growth, similar to the life of Joseph and his posterity, described as a fruitful vine. Yes, a fruitful vine whose branches climbed over a wall. Genesis chapter 49 verse 22. 118. Well of Living Waters A fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 15. The King A fountain of gardens, a well of living waters. Jeremiah, chapter 17, verse 13, New King James Version says, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. My soul was parched, etched in the earth. I was as the lazy man whose vineyard was overgrown. Nettles and weeds covered the face of the ground, and the stone wall was broken down. Proverbs chapter 24, verses 30 to 31. I had no visual inspiration. I placed little value on the gift of life and the significance of time. I took no thought that they were both rapidly dwindling. One day, the dew of heaven fell on my land. Gradually, waters began to flow through my field. Dead seeds buried in the earth resurrected, and the sound of the singing of birds arrived. Life entered my vineyard, and by God's strength, I repaired the stone wall. There is now a fountain of water flowing freely from within. The sweet smell of vigor fills the air. An abundant yield is produced in season. And I, for the first time in my life, can bless my neighbor. Everything about my life and vineyard is to the glory of God in Christ. If not for his fountain of living water, I would have perished. The king closes out this stanza singing in praise to the life flowing through his bride. He sees a picture of himself safely secured. You and I have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 And streams from Lebanon A fountain as well as multiple gardens are found in us. We also possess a well with living water, and if that was not enough, streams from Lebanon flow generously, ministries within ministries, 
with the sole purpose of bearing fruit to the glory to God. We have seen the abundant holy life with the king gathered on our journey through Lebanon. See Devotion 114, Garments Scented with Lebanon. Now we have streams reaching from Lebanon's snow-capped mountains on high to the saints below. Streams from Lebanon demonstrates the limitless power of God and His ability to supply all our needs with the living water of the gospel through its tributaries, the spoken and written word, along with other divine technical discoveries in communication. These branches find their way into the souls of whosoever will come. Sweet Incense John chapter 7, verse 38, New King James Version says, He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Our sister's life is described as a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. She believes her king, as evidenced by his singing her praise. Pray for a life to be lived in such a way that Christ will confess you to the Father, and rivers of living water will flow from your belly. The king concludes this segment of his song. The Voice of a Soul in Love 119. The North Wind Awake, O North Wind, and come, thou South, blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden, and eat his pleasant fruits. Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 16. Our Sister Our Sister sings, Awake, O North Wind, and come, thou South, Blow upon my garden. The soul calls for the north wind to blow. This is not to drive away rain, for the winter has passed and the rain is over. See Devotion 60, A New Season. Rather, the call is for the golden splendor of fair weather to come from the north. Job chapter 37, verse 22. It is a call for the divine breath of heaven to blow on his garden below. We have seen the magnificence of our sister's lush garden and the fruits of holy living. Now her desire is for the spirit to blow over her life, whose pollen and spores, rich with the gospel of Christ, may permeate a world of lost souls. This request is not for selfish spiritual pleasures, but to broaden the reach of the church in the spreading of the good news of Jesus Christ, that the spices thereof may flow out. The spices are the sweet fragrance of the soul. This is the work of Christ. The spices of the saints should not be confused with the spices of the wicked. See Devotion 112, How Beautiful Is Your Love. The outpouring of spices is the result of divine breath. Acts chapter 2, verse 2. In the natural world, Spores and pollens are best dispersed by the power and breath of the wind. Furthermore, in the realm of the spirit, the breath of life blew on man, and he became a living soul. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And again, the breath of life blew on his disciples, and they received the Holy Ghost, commissioning them for the work of the ministry. John chapter 20, verse 22. And the bride is requesting the breath from heaven as well. Let my beloved come into his garden. The will is a great hindrance to growth and development in Christ. We learned early on in this love song to turn our will over to the will of the king. We are to let him. See Devotion 2. Let him. Until this is done, little budding is found in the garden. Note this stanza closely. It is no longer my garden, but his garden sings our sister and friend. This is another stride in the relinquishing of our will to the king. This revelation must sink down into the fertile ground of the heart. We are not our own, but have been bought with a price. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. If we understand this, we too will sing, Let my beloved come into his garden. 
oh for the will to truly give all over to the king when he asks keep this in mind everything we possess is the king's some say they have given themselves completely over to the king's will but when he comes to weeding and pruning those things that have stunned their growth they draw back and close down like the popular sham plant mimosa pudica this delicate herb quickly closes its leaflets when touched this should not be our response to the lord's work we are not our own we are christ's see devotion 69 he is mine our sister desires every aspect of her life to be released to the will of her king the north winds blow sending out spices should the winds blow and strip away let it be sweet incense the wind blows where it wishes john chapter 3 verse 8 but this should not prevent us from making a request if your desire is for the sweet spices of gospel within you to reach the ends of this earth ask the king to send his north wind 120 pleasant fruits and eat his pleasant fruits Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 16. Our Sister. Our Sister invites her king to eat the sweet fruits within his garden. What do these fruits look like? The principal fruit produced is love. Love is the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians, chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. God is love. 1 John, chapter 4, verse 8. Love's offshoots appear as joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All of these characterize the fruit that is in love. How many of us have asked the king to come and find pleasure in what he sees, hears, smells, touches, or tastes in our lives? Fruit honors God and humanity. Judges chapter 9 verses 9 through 13. Our fruit is not to be selfishly stored away. Rather, we should freely extend ourselves as branches on a tree, eagerly reaching out to make it easy for others to taste and see. Fruit of the Spirit and Senses Have you perceived the fullness of love or tasted the sweet flavor joy brings on the face of a once miserable soul? Peace has a rich aftertaste and is satisfying to the belly. Have you seen the fruits of patience deliciously consumed by a once frustrated mortal? Have you handled the coat that surrounds kindness? Have you consumed goodness or smelled the fruity flavor that comes with faithfulness? Gentleness has a wholesome sound, and self-control is pleasant to the eyes. If you desire to please Christ, bear fruit. Couples, if you want to satisfy your spouse bear fruit. All of these are the ways of love, and our sister has them in abundance. Sweet Incense John chapter 15 verse 16, New King James Version says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask in the Father in my name, he may give you. Our sister concludes this segment of her song. Chapter 5 A Searching Soul And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 13 The King's Lovely Voice 121 Enter into Pleasures I am come into my garden my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O oh friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O oh beloved. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 1. The King. Our King sings, I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse, the king enters into his garden. He is claiming it for himself, consuming every beautiful pleasure in sight. 
This is the desire our sister hoped for. Oh, the joys of pleasing the king and the spirit to please your spouse. Pleasures have their purpose in God's plans. Within the garden is a special private place. See Devotion 115, A Closed Garden. And our sister has released her will to the king. See Devotion 119, The North Wind. It is in this place of intimacy the king begins to gather and gracefully devour the pleasures of his bride's ripe fruit. The church has a special private place within its garden reserved for our king. Each one of us has our own special time with him. See Devotion 12, The King's Chambers. When Christ enters into the soul that has answered his call, a love relationship begins. Through holy living, we worship and bless the king, something he takes great pleasure in. Sweet, beautiful fruit are ripening within and without. It is inevitable, for God gives the increase. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. The king sings, he has gathered his myrrh with his spice. His gathering of myrrh alludes to our bittersweet suffering for Christ. The spice he's assembling suggests an aroma of reverence to the king. See Devotion 38, A Bundle of Myrrh, Devotion 83, Perfume, Devotion 112, How Beautiful is Your Love, Devotion 117, Orchard of Pleasant Fruits, and Devotion 119, The North Wind. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. Honeycomb and honey speak of a spiritual enlightening that comes with understanding the sweetness contained within the gospel. Honeycomb and honey are sweet to the palate, and for the lover of God, the words of our king are sweeter than honey is to the mouth. Psalm 119, verse 103. I have drunk my wine with my milk. In this segment of our stanza, Wine implies the king's celebration and consumption of the spirit of himself in our sister. Milk speaks of ingesting the first principles of the gospel. See Devotion 113, Sweet Lips of Honey. Notice closely the steps found in the king's teaching. The receiving of the wine precedes the milk. In other words, we cannot taste the basic principles of the gospel without first drinking of the spirit. The above sustenance eaten in the garden points to the hunger of our king displayed in his humanity. He gladly consumed all that the Father required for our sakes. His disciples did not understand the immense appetite of Jesus. John chapter 4, verses 32 and 34, New King James Version says, I have food to eat, of which you do not know. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Now, with the fullness of the gospel, we have in some respects a clearer picture of the king's hunger and thirst for righteousness. Our sister has brought pleasure to her spouse, and we should at all times seek to please Christ and our spouses. Sweet Incense The king is well pleased with his bride, and he delights to come in and enjoy the fruit found in their garden. He has supplied everything you need to flourish and to produce undeniable joys. 122. An Invitation Eat, O friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O beloved. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 1, The King Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 to 2, New King James Version says, Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread, and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Are you searching for a meaningful relationship? Do you hunger for true love? Come to the call of the king. He wants to give you the love of himself. 
why continue to waste life on a world that cannot satisfy? We who have obeyed the King are called his friends. John chapter 15, verse 15. After the King has sufficiently dined, seen in our prior devotion, he wants to share our lives with other believers in the faith. Listen to the sound of his voice singing. Eat, O friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O beloved. Friends suggest the triumphant Elohim of eternity, ever active in our lives. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 says, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. The beloved is our sister, as well as all who love the appearing of the king and delight in assembling together. For those he has blessed with himself, he waters and gives the increase of fruit through multiple resources. This is the sowing and reaping principle, giving and receiving, one with another within the body of Christ. This is the multiplication of spiritual fruit to aid in the building up of the saints of God. What manner of love is this? We have gone from dust to deity. That is, we are joint heirs with God and His Son. Romans chapter 8, verse 17. We all were lost, alienated from God. We did not seek Him. He came looking for us. Genesis chapter 3, verse 9, New King James Version says, Where are you? His summons was to the world. Jesus' posture at His death was an open invitation. His arms were spread wide toward both the sinner and the saint. He calls for whosoever will come. Sweet Incense The king has blessed and continues to bless. He is well pleased with his bride and has invited his friends to celebrate with him. The king concludes this segment of his song. The Voice of a Soul in Love 123. An Awakening I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew, and my locks with the drops of the night. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 2. Our Sister our sister sings, I sleep, but my heart awakes. It is the voice of my beloved. Our sister is asleep during another lonely night. See Devotion 72, Lonely Night. Learning the lessons of love is a lifelong yield with eternal fruits, but we must be patient and watchful for the return of our King. Sleep is the mortification of the flesh. Romans chapter 8, verse 13. Romans chapter 8 verse 10 says, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. There is a sleep unto death for the world without Christ's awakening, and there is a divine mortifying and awakening when the flesh has ceased from its labors. Our sister is sleeping, that is, her flesh is asleep, but the mind of her spirit is awake to the voice of her lover. Her spirit is alert, but her flesh remains lifeless to things of the spirit. This helps explain why the disciples slept during Jesus' anguishing garden experience. Mark chapter 14, verses 37 to 38. God alone has the power to penetrate our flesh. He can touch the inner being and bring about a spiritual awakening when the flesh is mortified. Here again, the natural man is asleep to the spirit of the king. He cannot understand spiritual things. How many nights have passed when neither your flesh nor your mind could sleep because of the cares of life? But our sister's flesh is fast asleep. That is, her desires for the pleasures of the world have been put to rest, giving rise to a greater awakening to the things of the spirit and the ways of her king. She has shown us victory after victory over the deeds of the flesh. Now we see a new milestone reached on her journey of love. The flesh is sleep, while the spirit within her soul is aroused by the voice of her lover. 
Do the thoughts of the king awake your inner being? Has his voice aroused your spirit in the night while your flesh slept? Lazarus, Martha, and Mary illustrate the complete vessel yielded to the love of Jesus their king. Martha portrays the spirit, which desires to please Jesus through service. Mary represents the awakened soul, which desires the presence of Jesus. And Lazarus depicts the flesh that has been mortified. He has surrendered to Christ. He is quiet and still, never saying a word. Lazarus is not moved by his surroundings. His flesh is asleep after his awakening, stirred on by the call of Jesus. Lazarus, come forth. John chapter 11, verse 43. Sweet Incense In her deepest sleep, our sister can discern the voice of her lover. See Devotion 54, His Voice. The more the flesh is mortified, the greater the awakening. Put to death worldly things in the body, and be alive to the call of the king. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, New King James Version. 124. He knocks. That knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 2. Our sister. That knocks, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove. A knock at the door is appealing when you are in love. It alerts the person inside. Whosoever is shut in has the will to answer, to open the door or not. He knocks, reassuring his love for her. See Devotion 31, O oh my love. He knocks and praises her gentle, dove-like qualities. See Devotion 64, a dove, clefts, and the rock. Finally, her lover knocks, reminding her that she is the one he desires. She is perfect and undefiled in his eyes. See Devotion 104, Spotless. The king is both knocking and calling out affectionately to his love, his dove, his undefiled. Although he is king, he does not force his will on his bride. The door swings in two directions. First, it is opened toward the hearts of those who have answered the king's knock. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 New King James Version says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Second, after responding to the king's call, we are expected to come to him and knock as well. Luke chapter 11 verse 10, New King James Version says, Him who knocks, it will be opened. Search the scriptures and you will find that the knock at the door is with the hand of the man who touched and healed a leper. The same is he who stooped down, with his finger wrote on the ground, and forgave a woman of adultery. He made clay and anointed the eyes of a blind man, who after he had washed, received his sight. With his holy hands he took a child reported as dead by the hand, and said unto her, Talitha kumai, which is, being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, Arise. And straightway the damsel arose. It was the hands of the king of glory, healing the sick and the dead. Those pierced hands now knock at the door of the heart. Every beat is a knock, a reminder of the life he gives. Can you feel them? Have you heard and answered? My undefiled. The king sees us as undefiled, because of his goodness and mercy and how we respond to his knock. Sweet Incense Luke chapter 13 verse 25, New King James Version says, When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us, and he will answer and say to you, I do not know you, where you are from. If you have been awakened to the knocking at the door of your heart and soul, do not ignore it. Open unto me is the call of Christ. 125. 
head of dew. For my head is filled with dew, and my locks with the drops of the night. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 2. Our Sister. Dew demonstrates the grace of Jesus Christ ever falling, always in abundance, showering blessings on his creation. The Old Testament dew of heaven speaks of Jesus Christ, our King. He came from above, laid down his life for the camp of Israel, and rose again. He left behind the bread of himself in the form of manna. Exodus chapter 16, verses 13 to 15. The king's head covered with dew is from the long night spent outside watching and praying for those he loves. We are surrounded by the love of our king. Every inch of our encampment is covered by heaven's spirit-filled water droplets. The new day's dew brings a fresh anointing to the soul of those who will simply rise up, go out, and receive it in. The dew on the head of Christ was as a crown of glory and honor. Never a man wore a crown as he. He is king over the nervous nights in our lives, as well as the delightful days. The disciples had difficulty receiving all that the dew of heaven in bodily form had for them, and could not keep watch at night. Not so with our king. He labored through his darkest night on earth in spiritual conflicts, manifesting in his body, soul, and spirit. Oh, how he wants his disciples to experience the night, watching with him, even if it is simply for an hour. Matthew chapter 26, verse 40. The lessons of the night are the most difficult, and in some cases, they are repeated for our learning. Why fear? An abundance of grace falls during the night watch in the body of Jesus Christ. The king reminds our sister that he watches over her into the night and he is waiting for a response. Sweet incense. Jesus Christ, the gracious dew of heaven, laid down his life for you. His dark night of grace allowed you to awaken to his call and eat your daily bread. 126. Putting off. I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 3. Our Sister. The king stands at the door and knocks. Will you open? See Devotion 124. He knocks. It is cold and dark outside. There is always a risk of danger in the night. For the first time, we see our sister apprehensive. She does not want a night outing to give an appearance of immoral behavior. She would prefer for the lover of her soul to come in and be with her. I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? She begins to sing of her accomplishment in holy living. I have taken off my coat. This alludes to the soul's willingness to mortify the deeds of the flesh by putting off, that is, the removing of our former way of living. Colossians chapter 3 verses 8 to 10. I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? In other words, she is no longer walking in the filthy pathways of the world. She has had an inner cleansing that has manifested itself outward. Her feet are now clean. The task of feet washing was reserved for the humble servant, a lesson demonstrated by Jesus to his disciples. John chapter 13 verses 4 to 5. Feet washing was exercised at the close of each day. Its purpose was to remove the dirt picked up from daily living. If you are a child of the king, you, likewise, need to get in the habit of an end-of-the-day cleansing. Where have your feet carried you today, physically or within your imagination? Inevitably, you picked up the filth of this current age. Wash yourself at day's end with the cleansing power of the words of the king. Our sister has done that which was required for service in the royal realm of holiness. However, when the king sees those he loves at ease in Zion, he comes knocking. Think on the many times Jesus has given us victory in varying areas of life. Hallelujah! However, during the season of triumphs, we can become forgetful in other areas. 
Putting off is a lifelong labor we must not grow weary in doing. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20, New King James Version says, For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Our sister is found sleeping, and her king wants her awake at this time. A divine rest will come, but not now. There is work to be done. Sweet Incense Continue to grow into the daily exercises of godliness, putting off, casting away, and cleansing. This is the lesson our sister is learning. 127. Touch of the King My beloved put his hand by the latch of the door, and my heart yearned for him. Song of Solomon, Chapter 5, Verse 4 New King James Version Our Sister My beloved put his hand by the latch of the door. Have you experienced a time when the one you love was near and yet far away? A husband and wife may share the same bed, but their minds and bodies can be as far as the east is from the west. When communication ceases, you are out of touch. See Devotion 16, Sex. The king approached his bride. He called to her from outside of the door. He reached out his hand to the latch, or the hole of the door, as the King James Bible renders it. It is an opening that points to the possibility of eliciting an answer to the king's call. Reaching out is an act of love on the king's part, and if he does not receive a timely reply, he will pull away with the hope of a more mature response from his bride. The hand speaks of his power and authority. An extended hand welcomes those who are distant. See Devotion 52, His Embrace. The reaching out by the king of kings with his hand at the door of the heart is the power and authority he holds. He extends his humble, mighty work of love toward us, no matter where we are in life. His goal is to draw souls to salvation. King Nebuchadnezzar resisted the love of God, and his heart was changed to that of a beast. He was driven away from men, his throne, and his kingdom. But in the process of time, Love from the king of heaven reached down with the power of his hand and touched the door of Nebuchadnezzar's heart. Daniel chapter 4 says, And at the end of the time I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. The Power of a Touch A son left his father's estate and fell on difficult times. He slept, ate, and lived with harlots, husks, and hogs. He wasted his inheritance. But God, by the power and authority he holds, came calling at the door of the heart of this wayward son. We read that he came to himself, returned to his father, and repented. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. The Authority of a Touch how long will it be before we answer the touch of the king at the door of our hearts? It is the love of the king who gives us the ability to love and be loved. Sweet Incense Our sister's heart and soul are touched. The king is calling her out from a comfort zone. Can you identify with this? You know his voice. You are familiar with his touch. Now it is up to you to respond. 128. My heart yearned for him, and my heart yearned for him. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 4. Our Sister. Think about what it took for the heart of sinful man to yearn for the faultless God. It is amazing to consider. Yearning of the heart for the King of Righteousness is not our natural way. Adam and Eve had become one in marriage and left God. They refused to obey a divine decree. As a result, their fellowship with God and ours was slain. We all were dead in trespasses and sins. And Christ died for us that we might live. Today, when the king comes and knocks, 
a touch of the heart and soul by the hand of the king, we either answer or not. It awakens us to our two choices, to open to him or not. Those who respond by faith can truly say, My heart yearned for him. The knock of the Spirit of Christ touched our sister Ruth. She left us a heart-stirring testimony while speaking to her mother-in-law. She fervently cried out, Entreat me not to leave you, or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. Ruth chapter 1 verses 16 to 17, New King James Version. Our sister Rahab's heart yearned for the king after he came knocking. Her testimony was, The Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. And she bound the scarlet cord in the window. Joshua chapter 2 verses 11 and 21. See Devotion 95, Lips of Scarlet. He first knocked. My natural lust for things on earth perished in their season, and still I thirst for things that hurt with no rhyme or reason. My heart was stirred when I yearned for God I never sought before. I longed for him who calls me friend when he first knocked at my door. Sweet Incense It is the amazing love of Christ the King who gave us a heart to yearn for him. Keep this gift close and value it more than the wealth of this world. 129. Hands of Myrrh on a Lock I rose up to open to my beloved, and my hands dropped with myrrh, and my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 5. Our Sister I rose up to open to my beloved. Our sister finally rises up and opens to her king. He called her to rise up to a higher plane of living in times past. See Devotion 59, Rise Up, and Devotion 63, Second Call to Rise. And she willingly rose up in search of her king as well. See Devotion 72, Lonely Night. The king calls those who love him to higher ground. Rise up to his call. The strength of our flesh is its inability to respond to the call of the king in itself. We, like our sister, have been found sleeping when we should have been awake and serving. The prophet Jonah was such a man. He slumbered during his call to serve the lost in the city of Nineveh. And he, like our sister, had to be awakened to duty. Jonah chapter 1 verse 6, New King James Version says, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Are we asleep when we should be stirred? And my hands dripped with myrrh, and my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh. Our sister's hands and fingers, dripping with sweet-smelling myrrh, once again convey Christ's holy, bittersweet suffering and death, and our God-given talents to perform tasks relating to his gospel. See Devotion 38, A Bundle of Myrrh, and Devotion 52, his embrace. God has given us various talents and skills. It is the work of his ministry. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, New King James Version says, God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues, the works of our hands is the process of getting the message of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus out to the world. Sincere labors in the ministry are dripping with the bittersweet stories of the life of Jesus. The scent of myrrh is attractive to the king, and his bride is ever so careful to be covered with the sweet fragrance. Likewise, a wife delights to smell sweet for her devoted husband. She knows what scent attracts and stirs his emotions, and we should be covered with the fragrance of Christ. Upon the handles of the lock. The lock is our will. 
It keeps us bound inside. The lock prevents the joyful, free will response to the call of the king from entering into our lives. The lock limits and hinders the king's admission. When we give our will, a decision we make, over to the king, only then will the lock be anointed with sweet-smelling myrrh. An anointed lock gives the king unrestricted admission. The spirit of the king will guard against unwanted affections seeking entrance. Our sister knows this very well, so she ceremoniously anoints the handles and the lock with sweet-smelling myrrh when she awakens. Her work around her home is an anointing of the sweet fragrances he favors. She is essentially calling those things that do not exist as though they already do. Romans chapter 4 verse 17 Sweet Incense Affirmations of the soul anoint the handles and lock for pending work in the ministry. The things that hinder will either turn into service or fall away. O Lord, allow us an unhindered life that is free to serve you. 130. Her Lover Leaves I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 6. Our Sister I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. How long will love wait for a response? I do not know. Our sister's delay was not pleasing to her king. We have many time-sensitive lessons to learn in this short life. Do not let a slothful lifestyle rob you of intimate time with the one you love. It would have been wonderful to see our sister and her king pass through the door together, but it will not occur at this time. The king has withdrawn and is gone. Think about the many opportunities you have missed out on simply because you failed to respond in a timely manner. Too many of us let things of non-importance distract us from our true purpose in life. Distractions delay development. Distraction regarding the things of the king stunts the growth of all our ministries and relationships. Have you ever felt the presence of God pulling away? The distancing of the king of kings indicates our level of eagerness to look for him, or not. Why wait for the king to separate? Do not be careless in spiritual disciplines of prayer, fasting, meditation, reading, singing, doing good, and fellowship. Do not relapse and become less likely to respond to his call. Do not grow weary in well-doing and thus risk the king's separation. He will draw back from his closeness in an attempt to draw us back to himself. The Lord departed from Samson, Judges chapter 16, verse 20. The Spirit of the Lord departed from King Saul, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14. And the glory of the Lord departed off the threshold of his temple, Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 18. These departures were an attempt to provoke his people to return to their God, and the king leaving our sister will arouse her to rise up and seek him. Sweet Incense When the Lord knocks, respond quickly. Do not risk being separated from the king. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 6, New King James Version says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. 131. My soul failed searching. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 6. Our Sister. My soul failed when he spake. The king's voice continues to call out to our sister while he leaves. The sound of his voice caused her soul to fail. In other words, the soul departed into a realm unobstructed by the flesh. There is a distinct awareness of the separation between the king and the soul who has lost the closeness once shared. 
and should the king withdraw himself, the soul will go out from the weight of sin that so easily entangled it and into a less obstructed search, with the hope of finding him. She immediately leaves her comfort zone. She's demonstrating her power over the feelings of the flesh. She can distinguish between the separation of the willing soul in love from the flesh that restricted her obedience. She is now caught up in the search for the lover of her soul. This simply teaches that we cannot freely seek out Christ our King and all he has if we are bound by the emotions and feelings of the flesh. I sought him, but I could not find him. Many people have sought the King for selfish gain. John chapter 6 verse 26. Amos chapter 8 verse 12, New King James Version says, they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. If the king hides his face, he will not be found. We can in no way find God apart from God. He wants us to understand this. Our sister's search came up empty. We are living surrounded by those who think God works around them and their schedules, not so. He performs after the counsel of his will. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11. If he presents himself to you, you do well to hold on to him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. The king has stopped speaking. He has grown silent. He's not answering her. It is the divine silent treatment. Dear friend, the struggles will continue until our appointed day. Have you experienced the silent treatment in your marriage? There is a space for it, a time. Married couples must learn the sensitive, skillful art of communication, especially during the dark times. Couples communicate with each other in many ways, verbal, nonverbal, touch, gifts, deeds, sex, and much more. If silence occurs in any area of communication, let it be for a short season, or else you will be tempted by ungodly spirits casting contention and distrust on your marriage. Sexual intimacy is an area of communication, so be careful if it has been suspended. See Devotion 16, Sex. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5, New King James Version says, Do not deprive one another, except with consent, for a time. There is a time to keep silent and a time to speak. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 7 God will grow silent with those he loves as well as with the wicked. Elijah said in 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 27, The Lord hath hid it from me and hath not told me. Job cried out in Job chapter 31 verse 35, Oh, that one would hear me! Behold, my desire is that the Almighty would answer me. David mournfully sang in Psalm 13, verse 1, How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord? Forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? The king no longer answered selfish King Saul. 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 6. The leaders of Israel did not get an answer from the Lord because of their misdeeds. Micah chapter 3, verse 4. And the fool that refuses the counsel of wisdom will receive no answer. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 28. Sweet Incense. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13 says, And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. If you have tasted of the heavenly gift, and should the king presence depart, your soul would fail as well. If you have not heard from the king, do not stop calling out to him. If you have not found his embrace, do not give up your search. 132. Attack of the Watchmen The watchmen that went about the city found me. They smote me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. Song of Solomon, Chapter 5, Verse 7 Our Sister the watchmen that went about the city found me. They beat me. They wounded me. This is our sister's second encounter with the watchmen. 
they are religious racketeers, pastors, prophets, priests, and spiritual leaders in her community. We, too, have them in ours. They seek to destroy our love for the king and lead the righteous astray. See Devotion 76, The Watchman. Matthew chapter 13, verse 25 says, While men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. These watchmen are the enemies of holy living. They are wolves in sheep clothing. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Avoid them. The Keepers of the Walls The keepers of the walls represent the governmental body. The watchmen and the keepers of the walls are spirits of religion and the ruling methodology of this world. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. New King James Version. Both are in league. Our sister's love for the king is met with brutality. Do not be surprised, O lover of the king. They hate Jesus, and they hate you as well. A day is coming when the true lovers of God and Christ will be sought out, not for fellowship, but to be weeded out from the religious status quo. We will be struck and scourged, as were the disciples and many saints put to death for the love of the king. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13 says, But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Took away my veil from me. Our sister's veil is now stripped away, leaving her exposed. Religion and the world hate the veil of the righteous. It reminds them of the king, Jesus Christ. The veil speaks of the way we live for our king. See Devotion 91, Focused. The child of the king lives a modest life, exposed to God and spouse alone. The world wants us to live without restraints. The religious muggers of the world and the state seek to strip away the teaching of the king and expose us to the world in a repulsive way. Our sister is beaten and brutalized, all for the love of her king. She is discovered, struck, and wounded. This is a picture of the sufferings of Christ. Our lover and king was discovered in the night, then struck before the religious watchmen and Roman guard, the keepers of the walls at that time in history. He was wounded before his nation and died, numbered with the transgressors. Our sister is suffering for righteousness' sake. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, New King James Version says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Sweet Incense Many in this world suffer at the hands of the watchmen and the keepers of the walls for the great king. Pray to God to be found worthy to suffer for him, should that day come. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12 says, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. 133. A plea. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him I am lovesick. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 8, New King James Version. Our Sister. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem. Take note that our sister did not ask the watchmen or the keepers of the walls, see prior devotion, for assistance in finding her king. Rather, she sincerely asks the daughters of Jerusalem for their aid. In a perfect world, the watchmen and the keepers of the walls would have been of service. This is not the case. The soul knows very well that state-approved spiritual leaders, typified by the watchmen, and the government, characterized by the keepers of the walls, do not know how to find Christ the King. If the government were in charge of bringing the saving power and love of Jesus to the world, they would be hostile to the truth, tax the righteous, and regulate the gospel to impotency. If you find my beloved, the daughters of Jerusalem have many challenges. See Devotion 17, Black and Lovely, Devotion 19, Eyes of the Critic, Devotion 53, Daughters of Jerusalem, and Devotion 80, Distant Daughters. 
yet our sister asks them to assist in her search for the king. They previously had contact with the king, and she is hoping they will do some good. If you find my beloved, is her request. Immoral watchmen have failed in their task, and the keepers of the walls cannot save. Do not build your hopes on another to seek out and discover the king you say is the desire of your heart. How much do we want Christ? Are we willing to give up temporal things for the eternal creator of all things? Then continue searching, even if you are alone. In your search for the king, do not be led astray with preaching, teaching, books, and music that are rich on the current culture. Rather, lean on Christ. Do not waste precious time searching in places he will not be found. Be practical. Open the words of life eternal, the Bible, and commence your search. He is on every page. That you tell him I am lovesick. Our sister pleads, if you find him, tell him I am lovesick. Should heaven open, giving you opportunity to send a direct message to the king, what would it be? If you have been given an opportunity to live a life that would send a message to Christ and all creation, how would you live? Our lives speak louder than our words. You can tell Christ you are lovesick without ever opening your mouth. The same is true by how we live for a spouse. Sweet Incense Let the cry of your heart beat for the sweet communion of Christ our King in all that you do. Live a life that tells Jesus you love him. 134. Love Sick To look upon your beauty is a discovery and longing my soul had never seen. Your presence woos me, holds me, drawing me closer and closer until that perfect day. You completely fulfill my soul. You alone are the joy of my life. When I call, you answer. A yes from your lips is ecstasy to my soul and spirit. Should you whisper no, it is as a soothing caress. I am satisfied. Hallelujah. Completely satisfied. Why look for any other? Put to death that lingering urge within that would subject me to wander, for you know I am flesh. I want you with me always. Keep me close. Seal my imagination to you, O lover of my soul. I am in awe, spellbound, captivated, breathless, delightfully ensnared by one glance from your eyes. Why you looked my way, I cannot understand. Why you considered me is beyond comprehension. Should you slay me, I would find pleasure knowing it was from your hand. True happiness, glee, and such like, are pure and made acceptable only by you. Sweet incense, all the attractive desires of this world bow to your loveliness, O lover of my soul. Make me one with you. Our sister concludes this segment of her song. Voice of the Daughters of Jerusalem 135. Seeds of Doubt What is thy beloved more than another beloved, O thou fairest among women? What is thy beloved more than another beloved, that you do so charge us? Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 9. Daughters of Jerusalem The daughters of Jerusalem sing, What is thy beloved more than another beloved? The daughters of Jerusalem are telling on themselves. See Devotion 17, Black and Lovely. Devotion 19, Eyes of the Critic. Devotion 53, Daughters of Jerusalem. And Devotion 80, Distant Daughters. They, along with the world, wonder at the uniqueness discovered in the king. His own people ponder his relationship with the Gentiles. Beware of those who sow seeds of discords that germinate against your love of the king. Be on the alert for deceptive seeds. Seeds laced with doubt was all it took for Eve's heart to be deceived. The serpent said, 
you will not surely die. Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, New King James Version. Eve believed a lie rather than truth, and the daughters of Jerusalem doubt the indisputable eminence of the king. Galatians chapter 5, verse 9, New King James Version says, A little leaven leavens the whole lump. The words of God are true. Christ is truth. O thou beautiful among women! The daughters of Jerusalem agree. The beauty surrounding our sister is evident. See Devotional 28, Beautiful Among Women. Her loveliness provokes these distant daughters to jealousy, and the beauty of the lovers of God and Christ is not of our own doing. It is the gifting of His grace. The daughters of Jerusalem are offended by our sister, asking them to aid her in her search for the king. They do not want to share the king of Jerusalem with a Gentile. But it is too late. The king loves her, and she loves him. Rejoice, Gentiles! You, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Romans chapter 11, verse 17. Hallelujah! Gentiles are grafted into the eternal redeeming plans of God, with all the glory and grace. We are joined with the goodness that comes with being partakers of the root of fatness of the olive tree, that is, the eternal state of Israel. Both Jew and Gentile are possessors. The scripture foreseeing God would justify the Gentiles through faith preached the gospel message to Abraham. Galatians chapter 3 verse 8. Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, New King James Version says, And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The daughters of Jerusalem ask, What makes your lover any different from another? Christ, the lover of souls, is the same Christ of the Jew as well as of the Gentile. He is like no other. The daughters of Jerusalem are using the same trickery that had led them astray. If they can get our sister not to believe in her king in any way, maybe, just maybe, she will look for another. Husband, wife, this is one of the subtleties used by Satan to destroy marriages. Forces are in this world that attempt to change the truth into a lie. Romans chapter 1 verse 25. They sow doubtful seeds over the ecumenical landscape, and many have taken root. The daughters of Jerusalem are in error, but there remains hope for them. Sweet incense. Do not allow the influences of this world to take your focus off of the King of Heaven. Believe His words, cherish His promises, and expect His appearance. 136. A Charge. What is thy beloved more than another beloved, that you do so charge us? Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 9. Daughters of Jerusalem. The daughters of Jerusalem confess. Our sister tries to persuade them into a life of loving and living for the king, but her words are met with skepticism. They speak, Why do you charge us so? When you have found the love of your life, you naturally want to tell anyone who will listen. Our sister discovered true love. Rather, true love found her and revealed himself to her with all his glory, power, majesty, and might. He has proven himself in all his ways, and she entreats the daughters of Jerusalem to look, listen, and learn the way of love. This alludes to Christ's church and the Jews being provoked to jealousy. Romans chapter 10 verse 19 says, But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. The daughters of Jerusalem reject the charge from our Gentile sister, and the same spirit is seen in today's world as well. Sweet Incense Our king is more than any other love in this world. Oh, that the veil over the eyes of the Jew would quickly be removed so that they perceive the glory of their king. Romans chapter 11, verses 11 to 12, 
New King James Version says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now if their fall is riches for the world, and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? The Daughters of Jerusalem conclude this segment of the song. The Voice of a Soul in Love 137. White and Red My beloved is white and red, the chiefest among ten thousand. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 10. Our Sister Our Sister Sings the king is white and ruddy. These words speak more so of the holy, healthy look into the gospel of the King Jesus. White is unblemished holiness. Ruddy, or red, is the healthy appearance contained on the pages of Scripture. Now that Jesus has returned into glory, we no longer know him regarding his flesh. Rather, we know him after his spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. It is the spirit within the gospel that gives way to a healthy, vibrant soul. Was there any wickedness found in our Messiah? No, none. No one could convict Jesus of any sins. John chapter 8, verse 46. He was as a lamb without any blemish and without spot. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. His methods were pure, his life beyond reproach. He brought health to the flesh and restored the soul. The Pharisees could not trap him in his words, and Rome found no fault in him. My beloved was white in life and in death. He was ruddy, bloodied, bruised, and buried. The ruddiness of his blood cleansed away the stains of sin, making us white as snow. Christ is the perfect propitiation the chief among ten thousand. Our sister is singing of Solomon's prominence. The lovely parallel between father and son is evident. Solomon's aggregate strength and beauty are descriptive of his father, David, who was worthier than ten thousand men. 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 3. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13, New King James Version says, for when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. Our sister's king is white and worthy. There is none other worthy to stand before him. And of Christ, the king is superior and beautiful, the greatest of ten thousand. He is at the top of every mountain, the pick of the crop. He is better than all the rest. He is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. Ten thousand universes would be eclipsed by the boundless babe of Bethlehem's star. Ten thousand suns cannot radiate the brilliance of the only begotten Son of righteousness. Who is strong like our God? Psalm 89, verse 8. No one. Sweet Incense the holiness of Christ our King stands alone. No other gods are worthy to be mentioned among his name. 138. Sovereign and Obscure His head is as the most fine gold, his locks are bushy and black as a raven. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 11. Our Sister His head is as the most fine gold, Having a head of gold speaks foremost of the king's supreme authority. See Devotion 34, Jewels, Her Neck, and Gold, and Devotion 89, Silver, Gold, Purple, and Love. Gold points to the pure, sovereign reign of Christ. He is the eternal God that will appear in the latter days. Daniel chapter 2, verse 45 says, A stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. That stone is none other than Jesus, and those other earthly elements represent the kingdoms of this world that oppose his authority.
His hair is bushy and black as a raven. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, New King James Version says, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Yet the blackness of our sister's king's hair alludes to the beauty and mystery surrounding the Godhead. Psalm 18, verse 11, New King James Version says, He made darkness his secret place. His canopy around him was dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Psalm 97, verse 2, New King James Version says, Clouds and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Have you wondered on the works of God and Christ before he created the earth, universe, galaxies, or time? What was before to hang the earth on? Job chapter 26, verse 7. Have you pondered the life of Jesus as a young child living in Egypt or his early years as a young man living in Nazareth? Why are those days obscured? What transpired during the three days and three nights of Jesus' death descent into the heart of the earth? When will he return from heaven? Why does he care for you and me that he would go through this? His divine nature is covered with black flowing locks as a dark veil, impenetrable, full of hidden glory and mystery to the carnal mind. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 10 says, But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Deuteronomy chapter 29 verse 29, New King James Version says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Although God forbade the Hebrews to eat the ravens, Leviticus chapter 11, verses 13 and 15, they were his instruments, serving his prophet Elijah, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 4. It is a mystery why God used these unclean birds of prey in the service of his holy prophet, and it is a greater mystery why God uses man, a marred vessel, to fulfill his purposes. Seasons of life are full of mysteries, but the unknown should never prevent us from having faith in the abilities of our king. Comparing the black hair of the king with the blackness of a raven teaches us, even in the flight of uncertainty, the perfect will of God will be accomplished. Proverbs chapter 25 verse 2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Sweet Incense Romans chapter 11 verse 33, New King James Version says, O oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out! God is holy in all His ways, and eternity may fail before the depths of His mystery and glory are exhausted. 139. Focused, spotless, and adorned. His eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of waters, washed with milk and fitly set. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 12. Our Sister. His eyes are as the eyes of doves. Our Sister praises her king's dove-like eyes that are focused in on her and he has praised her eyes that are, like the dove, focused on him. See Devotion 41, Beauty and Dove's Eyes. The more Christ dwells within us, and we in him, we take on eyes of doves. That is, our lives have focus and are not distracted on temporal things. We look to the king for all and learn to see as he sees. Eyes of doves point to the king's peaceful, focused nature to accomplish the will of his Father. Our salvation is his focal point. Our peace is in his vision. Husbands, do you have eyes fixed on your wife as the king focuses on his bride? By the rivers of waters. Water in the arid holy land is life to people and beast. The phrase, by the rivers of running waters, speaks of the abundant, peaceful life in Christ Jesus. 
the rivers of waters carry a refreshing, merry melody. The glistening, flowing waters are robust. The smell is clean. The taste is satisfying. The touch invigorating. These waters penetrate the fertile soil of the soul. We have been cleansed and have life eternal. Trusting the king brings his promise of rivers of living waters bubbling up and out of the belly of those who believe in him. John chapter 7 verse 38 Washed with milk Milk implies the fundamental growth and development in the gospel of Jesus Christ. See Devotion 113, Sweet Lips of Honey. The eyes of doves washed in milk speaks of the king's vision for the saints bathed in the words of truth. We are without spot. Those who love to look to Jesus' return have been cleansed by the words he spoke to us. And fitly set. Eyes fitly set refers to the eternal vision of Christ adorning abiding authority. He is seated on his throne, in position, as a gem in its setting. His eyes are fixed, fitly set, locked in on his bride. Sweet Incense the king is determined to see you through. He is watching over his word to perform it. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 12. His pure life is our example for holy living. He is beautiful in every way, and we have taken on his likeness. 140. The Beauty of His Death and Resurrection His cheeks are as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers, his lips like lilies, dropping sweet-smelling myrrh. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 13, Our Sister. His cheeks. This stanza echoes the beauty of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and the results seen in the lives of all who love him. Cheeks represents his beauty seen in those who love him. See Devotion 33 her cheeks. Not so much as our outer adorning, rather, the inner person of our hearts. Here, we wear ornaments of meekness and a quiet spirit. This is a great price in the sight of God. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. Are as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers. These spices are not the fleeting sensual pleasures in this life. They can be seen as the embodiment of the life of Christ and his saints. See Devotion 19, The North Wind. A bed, that is to say, a garden bed, reflects Christ's body wrapped in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. John chapter 19, verse 40. He was laid to rest in a garden tomb. John chapter 19, verse 41. Three days later, he arose from the grave. This translates to a multitude of spicy, sweet, resurrected, flowering souls pushing up from the earth. Matthew chapter 27 verse 52 says, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. We were as seeds, once dead and buried with Christ under the weight of sins. Now we are made alive, flowering in the power of his resurrection. His lips, like lilies, dropping sweet-smelling myrrh. Our sister sings of her king possessing lips like lilies. She is echoing his praise of her, sung early on in our song. See Devotion 46, Lilies Among Thorns. She is also singing of the bittersweet life of the king. See Devotion 38, A Bundle of Myrrh. The king's lips overflow with his words of promise regarding his lilies, the saints, and our tribulations. His lips resemble his lilies, the church as a whole, and we speak the words of Christ. Meditate for a moment on his words to the disciples in John chapter 16, verse 33, New King James Version. I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The lives of his lilies have a fleeting, bittersweet forecast ahead, but to the king, an eternal fragrance.
sweet incense. Jesus Christ, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, lived a beautiful life before God and the world. If you endure to the end, God is glorified, and you will be translated into his glorious kingdom. 141. Eternal Works and Affections of Glory His hands are as gold rings set with the barrel. His belly is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. Song of Solomon, Chapter 5, Verse 14 Our Sister His hands are as gold rings. The king possesses hands of strength, depicting the powerful reign of Christ. His hands have the ability to secure our salvation. He wears gold rings, reflecting the pure enduring wealth of his endless kingdom. See Devotion 138, Sovereign and Obscure. He has authority over the spiritual and the physical. By his right hand, he has promised to save those who obey him. Set with the barrel. The gold decorative finger rings are set with the barrel, a precious stone beaming with sea blues and greens. These colors allude to the depth and unsearchable riches found in the fullness of Christ. His belly is as bright ivory. His belly speaks of Christ's innermost gut feelings toward the church and his pure, spotless thoughts, pictured in the brightness of ivory. Overlaid with sapphires, the costly sapphires radiating blues describes the royal wisdom and truth surrounding the throne of Christ. The sapphire overlays Christ's holiness, pure love and affection toward his saints. Rejoice, fellow Christian. Christ our King is seated on his stupendous throne, which resembles a majestic sapphire stone. Ezekiel chapter 10 verse 1. Sweet Incense the works of the hands of Christ are eternal works. His deepest thoughts of love for you surrounds him continually. 142. Pillars and the Face of Excellence His legs are as pillars of marble, set upon sockets of fine gold. His countenance is as Lebanon, excellent as the cedars, Song of Solomon, Chapter 5, Verse 15 Our Sister His legs are as pillars of marble, set upon sockets of fine gold. The strength of Christ to support all that the Father requires is seen in his legs. They are compared with two pillars, standing firm, reaching to the heights of heaven. They are of marble, reflecting Christ's strength and purity, set on spectacular sockets of fine gold, pointing to the enduring royal riches of the kingdom of God. This is a kingdom established on the foundation of Christ, laid on earth as it is in heaven. His face is as Lebanon. Do not be confused with the appearance of our king's face. The prophet Isaiah tells us he had no beauty or majesty that would cause us to look at him or that they should desire him. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2. In his humanity, Jesus had the look of a common man. He possessed no physical attributes highlighting him. The desires of our flesh gravitate to things that appeal to the flesh. For this cause, Christ had the look of an ordinary man, so much so that Judas identified him to the Roman soldiers with a kiss. Luke chapter 22, verse 48. How would you describe the face of the completely ordinary-looking Son of God when we no longer know Him after the flesh? See 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. There is little description of Solomon until he ascended to the throne. Likewise, there is little physical description of Jesus until He returned to His throne. Our sister's lyrical description of her king has the look of Lebanon, white, not so much of his skin color, for he was a Jew. Rather, for those who have eyes to see, the aura surrounding the king is as spectacular as Lebanon, beautiful, pure, and refreshing. Take a glimpse into the loveliness of Jesus comforting the brokenhearted. Look into his beautiful lips that never spoke a word of sin or deceit. 
glance at the attractiveness of his forgiving sinners. Look into his alluring power to raise the dead. Every act about him was attractive, like the look of Lebanon. Excellent as the cedars. The king's face surpasses every excellence ever there was and ever will be. He is like giant cedar trees of Lebanon. See Devotion 44, Our House. The magnificence of Christ's face is pictured on the cedar, his height, his size, his strength, and his eternal majesty. The temple Solomon built was constructed with Lebanon's cedars. The image of Christ was found on every inch of the temple. Is the beauty of the church beaming in every area of your life? Is the awe of Christ characterized by the cedars taking root within you? How would the world describe you? How would your spouse describe your inner beauty? Sweet Incense The beauty and strength of Christ is seen in every aspect of his life, from the foundations he laid to the temple he built within you. Oh, that we might reflect his loveliness in words and deeds at all times. 143 Sweet mouth, love embodied. His mouth is most sweet. Yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16. Our sister. His mouth is most sweet. What are the sweetest words you have heard from your lover? Husband and wife. Are the words out of your mouth sweet to your spouse, or do they cut like a sword? Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 24 says, Pleasant words are as an honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. When Jeremiah found the words of the Lord, he said the words of the king were, The joy and rejoicing of mine heart. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16. Ezekiel was instructed to eat a scroll given to him from the Lord. He described the taste as honey for sweetness. Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 3. Taste for a moment the sweet words Jesus poured over a repentant soul. Luke chapter 7 verse 47 says, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. And to the leper desiring cleaning, Jesus said, I will. Be thou clean. Matthew chapter 8, verse 3. What are your needs right now? Whatever the difficulty, the king has a sweet word for you. Yes, he is altogether lovely. The king is completely lovely. He is perfect and precious in every way. He is delightful through and through. The attractiveness of those who adore him is absolute. Exodus chapter 15, verse 11, New King James Version says, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? See Devotion 31, O my love. Look into the loveliness of Jesus Christ. His name is wonderful. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. He causes the penitent heart to despise this world. Words fail, and time has done little in the minds of mortals and our meager mining to describe the greatest, loveliest life ever lived. There is no beauty outside of Christ. This is my beloved, and this is my friend. There is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. And there is a friend we can now call our king. His name is Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is a friend who loves at all times. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17. He loves and is love. He is my beloved, and he is my friend. See Devotion 122, An Invitation. Abraham was called a friend of God. James chapter 2, verse 23, setting for us a pattern of an exemplary life. As the love of Jesus grew in the fertile hearts of his disciples, and their desires for the world died off, he gave them new titles. He called them his friends, B. 
because everything the Father made known to Jesus, he shared with them. John chapter 15, verse 15. Intimate moments with companions build lasting friendships. Sharing thoughts, pains, tears, and joys with one another strengthens bonds. A love builds that is unexplainable, surpassing the love of women, was David's testimony. 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 26. O daughters of Jerusalem, our sister closes this stanza, conveying a courageous lyrical call. She directs her voice toward those distant daughters of Jerusalem. See Devotion 17, Black and Lovely, Devotion 19, Eyes of the Critic, Devotion 53, Daughters of Jerusalem, and Devotion 80, Distant Daughters. She wants them to know that she gave up all and completely dedicated her life in the service of her lover and king. Her love has an enduring friendship. This is how marriages are to blossom. Sexual passions will wane, youthful beauty fade, but a true friend's love will transcend. A friend. Faithful are the wounds of a friend who sticks closer than a brother. He'll exhort, reprove, and correct to no end, unlike none other. In righteousness let him strike me, and I will receive it kindly. The rebuke of your precious lips are like a purified oil spent over my head as a sweet scent. Sweet Incense Bring your searching for love to an end, dear friend. The words out of the mouth of Jesus are sweeter than honey. He is the embodiment of love. He desires to build a bond with you and longs to call you his friend. Our sister concludes this segment of her song. Chapter 6 A Peaceful Soul Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3 Voice of the Daughters of Jerusalem 144. Half-Hearted Daughters Whither is thy beloved gone, O thou fairest among women? Whither is thy beloved turned aside, that we may seek him with thee? Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 1. Daughters of Jerusalem The daughters of Jerusalem sing, Where has your beloved gone? Peace covers our sister, and wisdom is her friend. Previously, she asked the daughters of Jerusalem that if they find the king, they were to tell her. However, they questioned what manner of love is this that she should be called the love of Solomon. See Devotion 133, a plea. Where has your beloved gone? Notice, it is not our beloved, but your beloved. The daughters of Jerusalem do not claim the king's love for themselves. Now we know. These distant daughters were unable to find the king of kings. Neither could we if he had not first revealed himself to us. And yet he has called them with an outstretched arm, but they refused. Now blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Romans chapter 11 verse 25, New King James Version. The daughters of Jerusalem have not given up their love of the affections of this world and will remain distant until these issues are resolved. Their growth is like a nutrient-deficient flower. They cannot serve two masters. Luke chapter 16 verse 13. The king has the resources, but the daughters of Jerusalem must be obedient to them. The daughters of Jerusalem inquire into the king's whereabouts, which speaks of their remote relationship with him. Imagine countless souls within churches, small groups and ministries, unable to find the king they claim to serve. They are active in so-called ministry, but inactive in living a life that brings joy to the king. O thou most beautiful among women! The king has sung about our sister being the most beautiful among women. See Devotion 28, Fairest Among Women. And the daughters of Jerusalem repeat it. See Devotion 135, Seeds of Doubt. In other words, 
our sister is the most beautiful of women. Why is this significant? Because the Lord has his eyes on his bride. Nothing else in creation is as beautiful. We have been made lovely as he is lovely. He has exchanged our filthy rags with the righteous white robes found only in the righteousness of Jesus our King. The beauty we possess reflects our King, and those who have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come may, in fact, recognize the beauty of the King's bride, as did the daughters of Jerusalem, but they will never experience the fullness in the life to come because they have fallen away. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 5 Where has your beloved turned aside, that we may seek him with thee? The daughters of Jerusalem ask if they might seek the king alongside our sister and friend. Doing so could hinder our sister, maybe even become a stumbling block. She is not opposed to serving those in search of holy living and dutifulness to the king. See Devotion 29, Footsteps, Flocks, and Shepherd. However, the daughters of Jerusalem have demonstrated seedlings of fear, doubt, and unbelief. This triune vine grows slowly, choking out the words of the king, and those who once bore fruit now become unfruitful. If they had made a confession of loyalty to the king, it is all but gone. Nevertheless, only the Lord truly knows, and he examines the motives of the heart. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 2. Sweet Incense 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Do not be lured into fellowship with people or groups having spiritless fruits and devoid of life. On the surface, the daughters of Jerusalem sing a good tune and appear to love the king, but the truth is, their hearts are far from him. The daughters of Jerusalem conclude this segment of the song. The Voice of a Soul in Love 145. Christ Came Down My beloved is gone down into his garden, to the beds of spices, to feed in the gardens, and to gather lilies. Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 2. Our Sister. Our Sister sings. My Beloved. She sings of how to find a peaceful, lasting, and committed relationship. It is found in a descriptive portrait of the life of Jesus Christ. My Beloved. You can sing Christ is my Beloved and truly mean it only when you have accepted him as your king. Your love for him will begin to grow. Here again, it cannot be overstated. He first loved us. Is gone down into his garden. Our sister began this recent search for her king in chapter 5. See Devotion 130. Her lover leaves. Her pursuit has found him in his beds of spices. We know Christ our beloved has gone down, rather has come down from his home in heaven to be active among his garden. Those are the chaste-hearted saints comprising his bride. See Devotion 115, A Garden Enclosed. Christ, not canonization, made us saints in this life. To the beds of spices. Within the garden beds of our souls are the sweet fragrances that surround Christ's life, death, and resurrection. See Devotion 140, The Beauty of His Death and Resurrection. It is all about Jesus Christ and his lovely life. Let thoughts of him germinate within your soul day after day, night after night. Explore the beauty of his life of obedience to the Father. Let your meditation be as sweet ointments greeting Christ as he enters into his garden. What other thoughts are worthy to receive praises from our hands and lips other than the life, death, and life again of Jesus Christ? to feed in the gardens, and to gather lilies. Notice closely that he comes down into his garden, the church as a whole, and feeds within the gardens a multitude of individuals. 
Cultivating the life of the Messiah becomes our way of loving and living. It brings joy to him as he stands as the captain of our souls. He gathers his lovable lilies to himself. See Devotion 45, A Rose, Lilies, and Valleys, and Devotion 70, Christ Feeds. The parables of a lost sheep, a single coin, and a son speak of Christ's persistence in the gathering of lilies unto himself. Luke chapter 15. He will bind and burn the wicked, but he will gather the wheat into his barn. Matthew chapter 13, verse 30. Sweet Incense Christ came into this world seeking lost souls to restore and return to peaceful fellowship with God. By Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, flowering shoots of lilies break through this earth, reach out toward heaven, and anticipate his rapid return. Your prayer should be, O Lord God, may I be numbered among your lilies. 146. An Affirmation I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He feedeth among the lilies. Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 3. Our Sister I am my beloved's. We occupy the heart of the king as the earth cradles the ocean. This is a mystery. Our sister knows she is secure in her king, and he confirms his love for her. I am my beloved's. She has confidence in him. Wife, does your husband know of your confidence in his love as a husband, father, provider, and friend? And my beloved is mine. She sang this verse early in our song, and it is worth repeating. See Devotion 69. He is mine. Our sister is claiming the king as her own. My beloved is mine. We cannot, in all honesty, claim what we do not own. Those who attempt such a thing are living a lie, and the truth is not in them. 1 John chapter 2, verse 4. It is an amazing demonstration of the unsearchable ways of God in Christ that he allows humanity to be the possessor of divine pomp and majesty. God holds me, and I hold him by a measure of faith he has given me. The tree is in the garden, and the garden is within the tree. The roots are in the soil, and the soil is in the roots. The fruit is on the tree, and yet the tree is in the fruit. The seeds are inside the fruit, and the garden, the soil, the tree, and a well of living water is within the seeds. One holds while the other supports. We are every bit of Christ's as holiness is to God. Hallelujah! You must own Christ as the lover of your soul. Sing it. He is mine, and I am his. Christ has given himself to whosoever will come. Has he called you? Will you come? He feeds among the lilies. We sang this verse in an earlier stanza. See Devotion 70, Christ Feeds. We also saw where our sister feeds among the lilies. See Devotion 101, Feeding Among Lilies. We are the lilies of God in this world. See Devotion 45, A Rose and Lilies, and Devotion 46, Lilies Among Thorns. We feed among the lilies in our fellowship and service toward one another. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, New King James Version says, Therefore comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Christ is among us in our activities, sharing, feeding, and leading as he pleases. Regarding the Savior of the soul, the only possession we carry into eternity is what has possessed us in brevity. Sweet incense, you are Christ's and Christ is yours. You have been granted an amazing gift that marvels the minds of angels. You are a child of God. Believe it, speak it, and live it. Our sister concludes this segment of her song. The King's Lovely Voice 147 Beautiful as Tirza 
Thou art beautiful, O my love, as Tirza, comely as Jerusalem, terrible as an army with banners. Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 4. The King Our King sings, Thou art beautiful, O my love. The King echoes a second time the expression, O my love, reassuring his commitment to our sister and friend. See Devotion 31, O my love. As Tirza, over and over again, the king praises the unmitigated beauty of his bride. Husband, do you praise the beauty that surrounds your bride? You can never praise her enough. The king compares the beauty of our sister with Tirza, which means delightful, favorable, and pleasant. Tirza was a peaceful region within the northeast highlands of Samaria. Today, it is identified as the West Bank of the Promised Land. One of the five daughters of Zelophehad was named Tirza. She, along with her four sisters, were granted hereditary rights to land, an unprecedented act. The right to possess the Promised Land was a favorable gifting, the inheritance of God. It gave these women wealth and power while demonstrating the king's consideration toward the rights of the women in that day. Numbers, chapter 27, verses 1 to 11. The comparative beauty of our sister is once again pictured in the lovely work of the king. Our sister is like a firstborn child, and the grace of God has rewarded her with an inheritance. Remember, as Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 12 to 13, New King James Version says, At that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Sweet Incense Tirza is a beautiful strip of land as well as a lovely individual. Both portray our sister's right standing in the eyes of her king and an endless legacy. You as well have a favorable inheritance, as lovely as Tirza, all the makings of Christ your King. 148. Jerusalem. Comely as Jerusalem. Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 4. The King. Lovely as Jerusalem. Jerusalem is Salem. Jerusalem is Salem, and Salem is peace. It's the city of David through the Jebusites' defeat. The holy city, the city of God, built on a stronghold, there the peace of Zion abodes. It's the Lord's holy mountain, the city of truth, the rock of the plain where righteousness reigns. They weren't the largest nation, nor the strongest on earth. It was the grace of the Father, He gave them worth. The most high mountain beams Mount Moriah, there's joy and gladness where the Lord is seen. It's the Lion of God, the Virgin of Israel, the Valley of Vision. There is Ariel. The city where David camped, my tent is in her. A mountain of holiness forever will be blessed. You're a sought-out city, a city not forsaken, a habitation of justice, a city called Jebus. But that faithful city left its first love, and turned from the Lord of glory above, to serve with rigor the gods of the heathens. They walked naked, they were beaten, and the Lord held them in treason. When God saw Aholibah and the tents where he dwelt, his heart was overwhelmed with tender love for Israel felt. He wet his sword, wrapped himself in zeal. With his arm he brought salvation, and his righteous acts revealed. The perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth is the joyous city they will see a new birth. The Lord will return to rule in that place, and all the world will see his face. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, beautiful city of peace, the Lord will restore, and your adversaries will cease. Sweet incense. Our sister and the church are lovely. So is Jerusalem, where Christ your King will return to reign. Jerusalem is designated an eternal city. 
those who love and look for the coming of Christ will experience a city like none other. 149. You are awesome. Terrible. Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 4. The King. Dreadful. The king sings of the awesomeness of our sister. She is a fighter. She carries the power of peace within her soul. She's confident in the strength of the king to mobilize his army on her behalf. This is how our king sees the faithful in the world today. Living exemplified lives before God is dreadful to the powers of darkness. James chapter 2 verse 19, New King James Version says, You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Jeremiah chapter 20 verse 11 says, But the Lord is with me as a mighty terrible one. Therefore my persecutors shall stumble, and they shall not prevail, for they shall be greatly ashamed, for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. When men and women please the Lord, the presence of God resides on them. No one or anything will harm them except the Lord wills. Believe this. When Jacob returned to Bethel, the house of God, we read that a fear from God spread over the people in all the towns of that area, and no one attacked Jacob's family. Genesis chapter 35, verse 5. Parents, do you pray for your family's safety and goodwill? Living a life pleasing to the king does not give you or your family a free pass around life's difficulties. John chapter 16, verse 33, New King James Version says, in the world you will have tribulation. Rather, prayers are to mature us in trust, faith, and hope of a deeper love for God. Knowing our adversary seeks our hurt, at the same time he is fearful of our union with God. The words of God through Moses to the people were, This day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you upon the nations under the whole heaven, who shall hear the report of you, and shall tremble and be in anguish because of you. Deuteronomy chapter 2 verse 25, New King James Version. Rahab told the two spies, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is falling upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. Joshua chapter 2 verse 9. Saul, that selfish, wild will king of Israel, was fearful of the God-loving son of Jesse. We read, Saul was still more afraid of David, so Saul became David's enemy continually. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 29, New King James Version. Serving God provides advantages. An evil spirit ran to Jesus, bowed before him, worshipped him, and begged him not to torment him. Mark chapter 5, verses 6 to 7. You are in Christ, and Christ is in you. The wicked one knows this. When he sees you, he sees Christ in you, and it is a fearful thing. You are awesome in Christ. Christ told us that we will drive out demons in his name. Mark chapter 16, verse 17. Do you believe it? The disciples of Jesus returned with this testimony. Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Luke chapter 10, verse 17. Our advisory is on alert. Do not claim what you don't own. Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. But who are you? Acts chapter 19, verse 15. Sweet incense. The lover of God the King is an awesome force in the world, dreadful as an army. Because of your presence, the powers of your advisory are kept in restraint. Never forget the war you are engaged in and the power of your king that sustains you. 150. As an army. As an army with banners. Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 4. The King. Our sister is as an awesome army with banners. See Devotion 50, A Banquet and Banner. In true love, 
the king sweetly reminds our sister of the war. See Devotion Day 86, Israel's Valiant, Devotion 87, The Sword and War, and Devotion 88, A Chariot. Battles are raging all around us. Our souls are engaged in a war with the evil one. Will you remain faithful to Christ the King? How often do assaults against your marriage occur? Were you able to see the attacks from the enemy while still far off? Or were you ensnared unaware? We are not to be ignorant of our enemy's devices. The battle to destroy godly marriages is as real as the fight to destroy our relationship with our king. True lovers of God have no hiding place unless he wills. Banners identifying our allegiance fly over the heads of those who love the king. His banner over me was love. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 5. The spirit of the wind excites the banners overhead. Likewise, the spirit, who blows where he wills, thrills the servant's soul. Knowing this, stand strong with arms locked in one accord in the unity of Christ. We are in the awesome army of God. Contend for the faith, marriage, children, family, friends, and righteousness. Sweet Incense The lovers of the Lord are a formidable force in this world. You are dreadful to the powers of darkness. Do not give in to sin. Take a stand for righteousness. Continue the good fight of faith. Amen. 151. Captivated Turn away thine eyes from me, for they have overcome me. Thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Gilead. Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 5. The King Turn away your eyes from me, for they have overcome me. The king is in no way telling our sister to turn and walk away from the love they share. No, he is simply using an expression to tell how he is completely captivated by her. Here again... It is unfathomable how the Almighty God and King, creator of everything visible and invisible, can be overcome with love and emotions for vessels made of clay. Every way of God is beautiful. Even in judgment His ways are true and righteous altogether. What is it that enthralls Him? One thing is certain. It is His holy image planted and sprouting within the souls of the righteous. A look of loyalty in the direction of the king makes an eternal impression on him. The look of our eyes, faithfully seeking his face, presses upon his heart in unspeakable ways. A glance from our sister's eyes is enough to ravish her king. See Devotion 111, A Ravished Heart. Now he is completely overcome by her gaze that is fixed on him. Oh, that the lost and weary soul would look to Christ and live! The Hebrews spoke against God and Moses because they had no bread or water, and their souls loathed the light bread, manna sent from heaven, which pointed forward to their coming Messiah. Then God sent poisonous serpents among them. Anyone bitten by a serpent due to their sin was instructed to look to the fiery serpent made of brass, which Moses crafted, attached to a pole, and raised it high and lifted up. Those who refused to look, died in their sin. Those who looked, lived. Numbers chapter 21 verses 8 to 9. It took the faith of whosoever would believe to look at the image and be healed. This symbolized Jesus's, our King, death on his cross. John chapter 3 verse 14. He was made a curse for us. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. And by faith, we look to him for life eternal. He is not an image hanging on a cross. He is alive and well. By faith, we look to him and his wonderful redemption, whereby we are made whole. A simple look of faith ravishes the heart of the king. The Lord's plea to the world remains. Isaiah chapter 45 verse 22, New King James Version says, Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Sing to him, declare his love, for he cares for you. 
looking to the king, is to believe and trust him by faith. He wants to be completely captivated by our eyes. Look to him for all your needs. Sweet Incense Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17, New King James Version says, The Lord God in your midst, the Mighty One, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Isn't it great to be loved? Capture the heart of Christ by simply looking to Him in faith and believing in His salvation. 152. Reaffirming Thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Gilead. Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 5. The King Your hair. This section of our song closely resembles a group of stanzas sung earlier. See Devotion 92, Your Hair. A woman's hair is her innate, God-given, natural covering of glory. It is an accent to her femininity, attractiveness, confidence, and strength. Do not disregard the bond between a woman and her hair. Is as a flock of goats that appear from Gilead. Generally, goats in the Old Testament are symbolic of strength. Goats of the New Testament refer to evil men. Matthew chapter 25 verse 33. Goats and Gilead declare our inner strength and stability to maneuver over the mountains, hills, and obstacles on the journey of love. The king is reaffirming the beauty of his bride's appearance and her strength in overcoming obstacles on life's mountains of adversities. Living in victory is a lovely, peaceful sight to her king, and he is not slack in his praises and promises toward her. Husband, this picture is a word of knowledge to be used as a blessing and encouragement to your wife as well. Sweet Incense Singing the praises of your wife's labors is as a bouquet of sweet-smelling flowers handed out daily. Her king is keen on his plentiful praise to his bride. And men, if you are married, do likewise.